This segment brought to you by Ting. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen and this is your weekly dose of Technolust. And I know that this is probably not the shot that you're expecting given that we have this awesome studio. But uh, yesterday Chevron, who has a refinery like kind of by our studio, decided they were going to explode. And so now there's toxic, noxious, nasty, horrible, ecological disaster to arrest some hacker kids. 10 points if you get the reference. Um, so anyway, regardless, I am doing the show from my car <laughs> because why not, right? And also, um, we have a fantastic episode for you guys this week. First of all, thank you for the awesome feedback on the, uh, the Wi-Fi workshop that we did last week. Um, and we've got more awesome stuff in that regards coming as we prepare for season 12. We've got some fantastic guests coming up. We've got some awesome mobs coming up. I'm doing crazy stuff with like solar and Wi-Fi and flipping tables here. It's going to be good. Um, and this week, I am very excited to be, uh, um, you know, presenting to you guys some of the killer stuff we got from Black Hat. And then, uh, of course, next week we'll have DEF CON and then back in studio with some fantastic stuff. But uh, so, yeah, that's what's up. And uh, thank you for tuning in. And I will see you guys on the other side. Dude, another awesome exploit coming out of Tactical Network Solutions. Love you guys. Last time it was ShmooCon and we were talking about... Uh, Craig about the um, or Craig about the, the the reverse stuff, and you guys said, "What do you do, do you, at the TNS office? Do you just like mess with routers all day, like consumer home routers? Is that your thing?" Yeah, basically, we do a vulnerability research on uh, network infrastructure. Yeah. And so, what is the the research that has really been tickling your talking to us lately? Um, well, uh, what, what I've been doing a lot of research on lately are these uh, Netgear Soho routers. And so, what brought you to research on Netgear Soho routers? Uh, basically, I was looking for some popular devices that I could find some low-hanging fruit on, and uh, uh, some of these Netgear routers are really popular and have a lot of opportunities for exploitation. And so, what kind of like, uh, how do you know like if a router is popular, and, and what, how do you go about exploiting it if it is? Well, so uh, basically, what I did is just go on Newegg and Amazon and kind of sort by the number of reviews on the device, and uh, I found one particular Netgear that like comes up in the top five, and I thought, well, let's let's go after it and see if see if it has any any good opportunities in it. So you get it to the lab, you unbox it, and you're like, all right, what next? Well, so actually, the 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 first thing I do is uh, go go grab the firmware update file from the vendor even before I have the hardware and unpack the firmware and see if it uh, see if it looks like there are any good opportunities in the firmware. If it's promising, then we order the actual device. No way. So you're checking out the bin file without even having the hardware. You're like you just assume like it's like some little embedded thing. It's probably Linux. I mean, you know, um, it's like on MIPS hardware or whatever it may be, and you start playing with that with the latest firmware. Yeah, and then what do you find and then how does that lead to saying, all right, let's purchase a dozen of these and see what we can get? So in this particular case, I um, unpacked the firmware and I saw that there was an interesting application in the firmware that provides um, uh, some of the multimedia capabilities in the device. I thought, well, let's have a look at that. And uh, uh, sure enough, it, it, it had, had a lot of uh, potential O-days in there that I thought, let's, let's get a device and see if we, we can actually exploit these. Okay, so tell me about the actual exploit. You got it in the lab, you're messing with the firmware. Uh, what do you find first off? Uh, so I'm looking at the firmware, look at the application, um, and I was, I was initially looking for buffer overflows, but then I came across a number of uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities. And um, so, so, so I found a SQL injection attack that will let me extract um, uh, some sensitive data from the system, such as clear text passwords. Yep. But now, the clear text passwords for the router or things that are going through transit or what? No, so you can actually, um, uh, uh, using this particular exploit, you can extract uh, uh, passwords uh, for the admin interface, also the uh, WPA key. <laughs> That's wicked! So you've got an exploit using, and what's crazy to think is we're talking about a little Soho router here, something that like grandma would set up in her home and it's got a SQL server running. That's fantastic. And so once you extract those WPA keys and those, uh, those admin passwords, obviously, you know, Bob's your uncle, you've got root, right? So not 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 quite yet. So so uh, there are a few 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 different directions you can go from there. So with the admin password, you know, you could log on to the device, 
mess around with the DNS settings, point it to, say, a malicious DNS server, mess around with the routing settings. But in addition to that, I've got a second exploit that's actually unrelated to the first that'll actually let me pop a root shell on the device. And then that's a lot more powerful. Oh, that's like that's like you know when you roll your own firmware or like unlock your you know do like DDWRT or OpenWRT you've like unlocked the the stock firmware you've got root on that uh, now what do you do because suddenly you know you're basically a man in the middle right so once you have root on the device then you can start start uploading uh, whatever attack tools you want because the device is running Linux so it's just a matter of compiling attack tools that run on Linux upload to the device. So you can intercept users' traffic, manipulate traffic, uh, launch attack tools that will attach attack other uh, devices on the network. That is crazy to think about, especially considering you know this is a a uh, small office or home router that people are going to be using and not really thinking too much about the security implications because it's a little plastic box. You plug it in, it's supposed to do the thing, and here you are, you know, getting root shells and you know whatever you want from there because you are the man in the middle. Uh, is this something that you can do, considering how popular this Netgear router is? Is this something that you can do remotely and just start spamming, you know, 255, 255, 255, 255, find these and pop them? Do you have to be locally on the LAN? Is it WAN, LAN? How does that work? So currently, the state of the exploits that I'm working with are only from the LAN side. But they do work. O they do work over the network. So as long as you're on the LAN, you can exploit them. And this device is vulnerable to Reaver. So as long as you're on the premises, you can use Reaver to connect to the wireless LAN and then attack the device. That is so fantastic. So what's next for you with this exploit? I know that you're here at Black Hat. You're talking about it. Uh, you know, where are you going with it next? Uh, who should, what should the vendor be doing in response to this? And uh, of course, where can people find like, you know, the exploit code and all that other fun stuff? Well, so um my, my next steps on this, on this attack are see if I can actually make it work over the internet. And uh, Craig, uh, that you interviewed before, he presented a tool a couple of years ago at Black Hat that will let you attack the LAN side of a router from the internet. And hopefully I can combine my exploits with Craig's tool and then, and then actually make it turn it into an internet-based attack. Um, so what the vendor should be doing um, is basically taking these devices more seriously as, as far as their security role on the network. These are firewalls, they play a security role, and they should have security requirements. And they aren't just simple consumer electronics devices, they actually need to have security requirements and, and uh, conform to those security requirements. So do you think like all home users need to just go out and get like Cisco iOS gear or Juniper routers for their like, you know, home lands? Man, I, I don't know what to tell you. I wish I, I get asked all the time, what should we use at home for our Wi-Fi or for our routers? And I, I think one of the disadvantages of doing vulnerability research on these devices is that you can't find a device that you can't find holes in. And so you get a little bit jaded. I wish I had a great answer for what to use at home. I know how you feel. I have a uh, I have an egg here at home. And yeah, I could probably just pop a Linux box in there with like an Atheros card, go into management and create an AP and all that other fun stuff. But dude, that is really wicked cool. Thank you so much. Where can people find more on the research? Uh, uh, they can uh, uh, they can look me up on uh, Twitter, zcutlip on Twitter, or zcutlip at tacnetsoul.com. Thanks so much, Zach. You guys have probably heard us talking about Ting over the past few months, and we are so happy to report that a lot of Hack5 viewers have already taken advantage of their customer-first approach to the cell market. Ting, their new service, they bring clarity, usability, and big savings to the mobile phone users. Ting has one simple plan that offers fair and honest pricing. Megabytes, minutes, text messages, they are all billed separately. So if you use more, then you just pay for the next tier. There's no ridiculous fees. Or if you use less, you're credited the difference. There's no BS. Check out ting.com slash hack5 and check out their online savings calculator. And if you're ready to get started, you'll get an extra $75 off your first month of service just for being a Hack5 viewer. Again, that's ting.com slash hak5. So Cody, what exactly is this lock here? This lock is the Onady HT lock. It's uh, in about a third of hotels. There are approximately four to 10 million of them worldwide. Um, and this is in all major brands of hotels. Uh, if you've been in hotels more than once, you've probably seen one. So this is literally like what I have over at the Rio or wherever where I just slide this in 
and boom, and I'm good. Yep. Standard hotel lock, they're all over the place. And, and so is this networked? Like when I go up to the front desk and they issue me a key, are they creating a mag stripe that is then like there's a Wi-Fi network or a Zigbee network or something where they communicate to that room's lock and say, hey, bro, it's this ID? No, uh, these are entirely offline. They're battery powered. And they're programmed using a port on the bottom, uh, which is programmed from the information at the front desk. Um, usually only when the batteries die and it needs to be reflashed. Okay, so when I slide this, it's just like checking if it's like, oh, that's the serial number I know because I'm room number 513 and now we're good. It actually doesn't know anything about what room it is. Uh, what it knows is that there's a code key value on the lock and uh, on the key card, there's that code key value. And if it's within a certain range, it, ta it says, okay, this is a valid key, and then that becomes the current code key value on the lock. So when a new guest checks in, it sees a value that's plus one of that, and it takes that as its new value, so the old key is invalidated. Oh, that is wicked. So every time somebody checks out and they issue a new card, the old one is invalid. That's kind of a brilliant way to do that so that, anyway, th and, and have all of these be offline. Uh, I must know, like, when attempting to hack this, why not just start trying to hack the uh, magstripe? So I did. Um, the magstripe uh, part of it happened earlier. I broke the encryption algorithm, um, and I figured out all the format of the card uh, so that I could make my own cards. But that's not really that interesting. I talk about the crypto, and I release the algorithm. It's completely proprietary. But it's really not that interesting. It's a 32-bit key, which is minuscule. Um, so even the most naive of attacks are practical against it. But there's not really a whole lot you can do there. The programming part is far. Programming port is far more interesting. Okay, and so this is like the service port that you know the technician uses to to reset these guys, or, or what? Yeah. So anytime the batteries die, there's no non-volatile storage on here. Everything is in RAM. So they have to reprogram them anytime the batteries die, or the time and date get out of sync for expirations. Um, and the port is just clearly exposed on the bottom. It's not that, that's just brilliant for service contracts too. It's like, well, we could have put some NVRAM in there, but. Why don't we just let the batteries die so that we can go and fix them all the time? Yeah, um, and they're not, they're not even rechargeable batteries. They're just standard four double A's, um, nothing special there at all. So what's actually running inside here? Is this just a pick or what? Yeah, just a little tiny pick, uh, epoxied on the board, no, no ability to program it or anything interesting you can do there. Um, but just a, a little pick, it depends on the board revision which one it is. I can't recall which one this one is, but um, very little microcontroller and it does Effectively nothing. It does a little bit of checking, a little bit of crypto, and that's it. And so how did you go about uh, reverse engineering that, and, and what was your inspiration to even...